The Voluntourist is the name of the book, and the author is Ken Budd. Mr. Budd, what's a voluntourist? <laughs> a voluntourist is someone who does a short-term volunteer trip. And you know, most of us can't take two years to join the Peace Corps. This is a way to do it two weeks, three months, a much shorter time period. When did you start volunteering? I started very unintentionally back in 2006. I was in New Orleans about nine months after Hurricane Katrina, and that was the beginning of sort of an unintentional journey that's, that went over the course of five years. So, uh, first of all, why were you in New Orleans, and what were your activities? Well, you know, I, I wound up doing this because I was going through one of those periods in life where you're asking, you know, what am I doing? I was turning 40, which is a great time for a midlife crisis, and this opportunity came up, and I took it. And they wanted unskilled volunteers. I said, well, this is perfect because I have no skills whatsoever. And I did whatever they asked. They, they have it worked pretty well that skilled people come in, contractors who volunteer, they clean out it, they do the serious work. Someone like me comes in and helps people move back in. We painted. So we did very basic labor, but it was necessary labor. Did you feel that your two weeks in New Orleans was worthy, was worthwhile? Yeah, you know, everywhere I went, I questioned that. I said, what can you really do in two weeks? And I found this everywhere I went, that there was, beyond the fact that, yes, it is helpful to paint a house, that there was an intangible quality of, it was good to be in New Orleans nine months after Katrina. People in the city were so happy to have people there, to have tourists back, to have people in the restaurants, and to have people who would go home and say, you know, I've been to New Orleans, I've seen it, you know, you've got to know what's going on here. So those qualities, I thought, happened everywhere. Ken Bud, what were you doing for a living prior to beginning your volunteering? Uh, I am an editor here in the area. I work uh, for an association in D.C., and I'm still doing that same job. So how were you able to get all that time off? Or um, did you use your vacation time? I used vacation time, and that's the nice thing about these trips, is you can use your own vacation time. And the problem is, of course, you're working that whole time, so you get back and you're like, I really need a vacation now. <laughs> but, so, but it is a way to do this on, in your own schedule, and, and most of these trips are tax deductible, which is nice as well. Is volunteering addictive? It is, you know, it, but it's funny. Every time I got somewhere, especially in China, I would arrive and think, well, this was a huge mistake. What am I doing here? <laughs> you know, I'm completely unqualified. But I would get home and think, wow, once, once you step back, you realize this was a really intense experience. And so it's a way to do just, you know, a little bit of good, but you also see a place in a completely different way, in a much deeper way than you would otherwise, because you're eating with locals, you're working with locals, and there's this interaction that goes on, and they learn about you, and you learn about them. So, in New Orleans, who did you hook up with? I mean, how did you get to be a volunteer? Did you, was there an office? Well, I, my job, they were working with a group called Rebuilding Together. And so I got an email that popped up and said they were looking for volunteers, and I just took it. And Rebuilding Together is still working there. And I, I was back in New Orleans in May, and I saw some of the places where we worked. And when I was there, these were completely vacant neighborhoods. And you would look down streets and just see rows of empty houses. And now these are functioning neighborhoods, but I was told that Rebuilding Together has had about 18,000 volunteers since Katrina. And the gentleman who runs the organization, we were driving through the city, he pointed out all the houses and he said, I guarantee you every one of these houses has been touched in some way by volunteers. After New Orleans, what was your next trip? My wife and I worked at an elementary school in Costa Rica. We taught English. And we arrived there our first day and I was told we would be teacher's assistants. And I was looking around the room and I thought, yeah, I wonder where the teacher is. And then we found out, oh no, we are the teachers. <laughs> so it was a rather intense learning curve as the first week we had to figure out what we were doing. It was first graders from sixth graders, so they had a different range of, of needs. And it was a little tricky. By the time we kind of figured out what we were doing, it was time to go. And we, we told the program people this, and now it's three-month volunteers, which makes a lot more sense, I think. So in your two weeks in Costa Rica teaching English, what do you think you accomplished? Well, you know, I, th I think, again, it's, it's sort of an intangible thing. And, and the kids certainly did pick up some English while we were there. And, and we, another volunteer was a teacher, and she taught us some tricks. So I, I think from a purely practical standpoint, their base of English grew just a little bit while we were there. But the principal also told me, he said, that it works well enough for him that he has very limited resources. So he can have volunteers teach English and then invest his limited resources in computers or in something else. So it's a win-win from that standpoint. Where did you live in Costa Rica? We stayed in a dorm-like setting run by the organization was Cross-Cultural Solutions. And we were there in August, so it was packed with college students. I think there were about 60 people when we were there. Two weeks later, there were eight. <laughs> so, it, you know, it was, it was a 
a great thing though because you're living in such tight quarters that we've maintained amazing friendships with people from the UK that we met and that's been another unexpected benefit that you make these lifelong connections with people. Ecuador. Ecuador I worked on a climate change project and it was up in the Andes Mountains it was a two-hour hike just to get to this place everything has to be brought up by mules because there's no roads and I felt bad for the mules until we started the hike and I thought well thank goodness for the mules <laughs> but these scientists they're trying to see how warming temperatures are affecting the cloud forest because the cloud forest is starting to rise and so as a volunteer we help them collect data we enter data and it's beneficial for the scientists they can run more projects with volunteer labor and it spares them from doing that kind of grunt work and lets them do better things is that where this picture was taken in ecuador this picture we have to confess is sort of more symbolic than uh, that is not actually me so uh, but we all pretend it's me and <laughs> all right how did you get hooked up with the group in ecuador well, I started with a book called Volunteer Vacations. And it's a reference book. About 150 organizations are listed. There are websites like GoOverseas.com, GoVolunteering.com. And Earthwatch is a group that does environmental trips. And that was something I wanted to do. And so they do everything from archaeology trips to, in my case, you know, more scientific studies. Ken Bud, this book has a lot of personal information right. in here as well. Why? Well, this was a very personal journey and you know I read a lot of memoir before I wrote this and I feel like you can always tell when someone's just trying to write a book and when something is really at stake and something was really at stake here I was trying to determine how to live a life that matters and how to live a life with purpose and I think the reader knows when you're not being honest and so I felt like I had to do it and it wasn't always comfortable but it was beneficial in a lot of ways personally this was like a type of occupational therapy so what did your wife think about some of the personal things that are in this book? Well, it was, it was difficult, and, and, and she and I are very similar in a lot of ways. We, we are, are not, let's sit and talk about our feelings kind of people, so it was good in the sense that it forced us to address some things, and we're in a very good place these days. Do you feel that right now you're living a life with purpose? Well, you know, what I, I came to realize is you know, sometimes you have to step back from your life to realize how much you cherish your life. and. In some ways, my life hasn't changed. I'm at the same job, I'm living in the same home, but I see things a little differently, and I feel like I'm a person of the world, not just an American or a Virginian. And any money we get from the book is going back to the places where I volunteered, and that has been particularly gratifying, as you know, money from the book paid for annual school fees for nine of the kids in Kenya where I worked, so that's been a great thing so far. Well, tell us about Kenya. Kenya, we worked at a children's home for two weeks, and. In Nairobi or outside? Uh, I was in Kenya, out in near Mombasa. And uh, there are about three women essentially caring for 42 kids. So, you know, they all, of course, have sad stories. Some lost their parents to HIV. Some were abandoned. And we did whatever work was necessary. We would fold clothes. We would wash dishes. We would take lunch to kids at the nursery schools. And, and in the mornings, it was very quiet because the kids were at school. And then we would spend time sometimes just with the babies because the babies, no one is there to kind of hold them and nurture them. So, you know, when we would take a break from washing dishes, you know, we would walk around with some of the kids and we helped a little girl to walk. And so it was a pretty emotional experience. Do you donate money at the same time? I mean, when you were there, would you buy things? We made that offer at the end. We said, you know, we would like as a thank you to, you know, we, we bought new mattresses for the kids because they sleep on these really thin mattresses. But the woman who runs the home said, well, why don't you make dinner? Which we said, well, great, we'll make dinner. But I have to tell you, making dinner for 42 children sounds like a great idea. Easier to buy mattresses? <laughs> yeah, it's easier to buy mattresses. And the problem we had, we made spaghetti, and Kenyans use these charcoal grills. And so we put this huge pot of water on, and like nothing happened. And the water just sat there. It was 15 minutes, it was 20 minutes. I thought, you know, we don't really have plan B here. It was starting to get dark. You know, 40 minutes, I thought, you know, we have an international incident brewing here. It took an hour for the water to boil, and we threw in 12 boxes of noodles and we did our meat and it was really gratifying because you see the kids outside eating and a girl had a noodle on her head because she had her face in the bowl and I thought well that's why you do this because you want to do just this little bit of good and, and, and you really have to persevere and stick with it but if you do you can and, and we learned later it was the first meat these kids had had like in over a month. When you and your wife would talk about your trips afterwards or talk to friends about this would you ever say I wish the US government were, were doing diplomacy this way? Well, yeah, and I, I, I didn't specifically go after the U.S. government, but I do think that is a huge benefit 
of these trips, and you especially saw it in the West Bank, you know, because, and to, this was, I was there in